saying preparing to live stream the meeting. I've never, all right, it looks like it's live on YouTube. Hi everybody and welcome to another installment of the Slavery Archive Book Club, um, uh, co-hosted by Ana Lucia Araujo, Vanessa Holden, Jessica Marie Johnson, and myself. Today we uh, welcome Lauren Klein uh, from uh, the Emory University, uh, who is going to uh, be talking to us about her latest book. Well, she has two out this year, so it's uh, as hard. Uh, you probably heard of the other one, that of feminism, if you're coming uh, to, to the session from Digital Humanities. Uh, uh, but this is uh, her other project uh, as uh, years in the making. Uh, it's a wonderful book, uh, An Archive of Taste. It's going to be talking to us about today. So I'm going to pass on the mic right away to Lauren. Uh, and she's going to present. Uh, and then after uh, her presentation, then we're going to open it for questions uh, and answers, both here on the Zoom and on our YouTube channel. To get that link, you can go to Twitter and find us on hashtag Slavery Archives. So without further ado, Lauren, take it away. Thanks so much, Alex. And thanks so much for everyone being here. If your Saturday is anything like my Saturday, um, getting to this point is already an accomplishment. So I really appreciate your, your being here. Um, I am going to just share my screen. You don't want to see. Zoom over here. You don't want to see it. Oops. This. Get that. Get rid of that. Alex, how does that look to you? Okay. Looks like, great. Okay, super. Okay. Um, so yeah, so um, so this is the book that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, it's called An Archive of Taste, Race and Eating in the Early United States. Um, and it does exist in print format, but the one thing that I wanted to point you to is that there's also an online um, open access version available via this link right here. Um, and so I thought I would talk about the book a little bit in terms of give you an example of sort of like a point of departure kind of thing and then walk through a specific example that has a lot of resonance for me and um, then try to sort of uh, give you a sense of the other things that happen in later chapters in the book. Um, so the point of departure for my book is in some ways it's, it's pretty simple. Um, there's no eating in the archive. Um, that's actually what I call the introduction. And I mean this not only sort of in a like a in the terms of a practical admonition, although it's a real one, you know, as anyone who's spent time in an archive knows well, but I mean it more as a methodological challenge. Um, you know, there's quite literally no eating or at least no food preserved in all of these documents that constitute the print record of the early United States, which is my area of study. Um, so I mean, you know, books, letters, newspapers, manuscripts, um, things like this. And actually, I feel like I should back up a little bit um, before I get into the details of this talk and just to sort of let you know a little bit about my background and sort of what brought me to this place because I'm not a historian. Um, I'm trained as a literary scholar, an early Americanist. And Alex and I were joking before that, um, you know, as an early Americanist, you always feel like you do historical work compared to other literary scholars and then you meet historians. And I think, you know, like, <laughs> No, <laughs> what, you do, what you do is very different. Um, and so my background really is focused on texts and close reading and providing uh, contextual information for those materials. But that's sort of where I'm coming from, from the perspective of uh, an emphasis on sort of the print record and the textual record um, of the United States. So I thought that I would actually just sort of show a quick concrete illustration of this point, this idea that there's no eating in the archive with um, a fairly generic letter. And actually that's one of the reasons why I've chosen to start with it because there's literally, you know, 
tens of thousands of letters like this that you can come across. Um, this is a letter written from Thomas Jefferson to James Madison in 1787 when Jefferson was serving as minister to France. And it's pretty much Jefferson just asking for stuff. Um, so you can see where I've highlighted sort of on the second half of the screen. Um, Jefferson is requesting that Madison send him, quote, a few barrels of Newtown Pippins. This was a variety of apple that everyone at this era, like, were kind of oddly obsessed with. Um, and then some cranberries to eat, and then along with some roots of this particular apple tree for him to attempt to plant in France. Um, and these roots, he says, would, quote, be very desirable to me. And then he proceeds to give like very detailed packing instructions for how they should be layered between sheets of moss, which is also very classic Jefferson, the sort of obsessive management and control, which is applied to things and also importantly people and a lot more on this in the future. Um, but the point here that I want to make is more obvious, um, which is that we no longer have these apples or cranberries to eat, even though we know that they were quite important to Jefferson on the basis of letters like these. So the basic question then becomes, and this is the question that I really asked myself at the beginning of this project, um, you know, which began as my dissertation a really, really long time ago, um, you know, what is a scholar interested in food and eating in this era? What are you supposed to do, right? Um, and so I've spent just a, a lot of years, at least a decade, if I'm being honest, probably more, 15 years, um, thinking about constraints like this. So, you know, food that I can't taste, um, eating, um, sort of this understanding of what eating meant, uh, this understanding that's just so far removed from what we might describe as our present food culture, and then I think most importantly about these methods that might allow me to recover some of this or not fully recover as the case may be. Um, and if that is the case, then how do we devise new methods to reimagine these experiences of eatings that are sort of gestured towards in the archive, but not fully recorded as such? And in the process of doing this work, this sort of thinking about the actual contents of the archive, um, you know, what it contains and what it omits, I've also been drawn to the conceptual paths by which eating sort of came to matter in this particular temporal moment. And so I make a historical argument in the book that if you're interested, we can actually get, go a lot deeper into this later, but it's essentially this proposition that over the course of the 18th century, eating emerged as a new form of aesthetic expression and was recognized as such. And as a result, it subsequently transformed into a means of expressing both allegiance on the one hand and resistance on the other to the dominant enlightenment worldview. Oops, and I forgot to give a page number to that. It's in the intro, you can find that quote there. But there's a second part to this claim, um, which is actually sort of the, the sort of second motivation for this book, which is that we can't fully appreciate the depth of this aesthetic mode, let alone the people who actually contributed to its development by relying only on the textual artifacts like the one you just saw. Um, these sort of documents, and I, like I said before, there's thousands and thousands of them that provide evidence of the foods that the founding fathers liked to eat. Um, you know, we also necessarily, and I mean this necessarily for historical reasons and also for ethical reasons, need to account for the experiences of eating that resist preservation, as well as the experiences of the people who were involved in, you know, just for instance, like who created the apples that Jefferson wanted, you know, who did those layers of moss, or for a related example, um, who was the particular person who prepared each one of the meals that Thomas Jefferson ate. And we actually do know this person's name, um, the man who prepared each of Jefferson's meals. His name was James Hemings. Um, he was Sally Hemings' older brother. And that family connection already gives his life a fair amount of context. Um, but what we do know about the specifics of James Hemings' life come to us through a set of documents that are vastly different from this letter about apples and cranberries that I began with. Um, and this is something that the like, scholars who spent a lot of time in the archive of slavery broadly conceived know really well. Um, so James Hemings' life is documented in artifacts like this one. 
what you're looking at here is the, it's called the Emancipation Agreement between Jefferson and Hemings, although it was written by Jefferson and it was witnessed by his white maitre d'hotel. This is sort of the French version of a butler or a house manager. Um, James Hemings' signature does not appear here. Um, some of the backstory is this. So Jefferson, he loved food so much and he believed that it was so important to advancing the cause of the Republic that when he traveled to France to assume his appointment as minister there, he also required that James Hemings, who was enslaved, come with him. And then as soon as they both got there, James Hem I mean, excuse me, Jefferson had a Hemings apprentice to the chef of a former prince. Um, and so Hemings in this uh, prince's kitchen learned to cook, you know, French haute cuisine. Um, in the process, he also learned to speak and write in fluent French. Um, he could also already write in English as well. And because in France, slavery had already been abolished at this point, Hemings also learned what it was like to be free. And actually, um, Annette Gordon-Reed has this monumental biography of the Hemings family, the Hemingses of Monticello. And she has a, a really excellent consideration of what this experience might've been like for Hemings um, to go from being enslaved in the United States to across the ocean being treated as if he were a free man in France. So if you're interested in that particular episode in Hemings life, I would direct you to Annette Gordon-Reed on that. Um, but for the moment, I just I want to focus on this document and the specific language by which it outlines the conditions for Hemings' eventual emancipation. Um, you know, and again, this is another indication of sort of how I use these documents because I'm coming again from a, a more literary, um, a more literary approach. So we can see here how Jefferson acknowledges Hemings' invaluable contributions to his dinner table, right? This is the art of cookery um, that he describes. And at the same time, begrudges Hemings. You know, this is the man whom Jefferson himself enslaved, right? Um, he begrudges Hemings the, quote, great expense of training him up as a chef. Um, he expresses a desire to befriend Hemings. And so there's this projection of what Sadia Hartman has called the circumscribed humanity um, that's often accorded to the enslaved, right? Um, and then Jefferson goes on to stipulate that Hemings must train another man before he can be free. And I've, you know, I've sat with this particular transaction a lot, you know, for a long time. And um, you know, each time I consider it, I mean, in effect, what's happening is that Jefferson is forcing Hemings to trade his culinary knowledge for his corporeal freedom. And I feel like in a way, um, I could probably sort of end my talk and the book honestly right there because this document encapsulates so much of what I spend, you know, 200 some odd pages discussing in the book. Um, but I, I do want to elaborate a bit more. Um, so what you see here is really, like I said before, very sort of clear and specific evidence of the contradictions of Jefferson's sort of lowercase r republicanism. Um, and this is obviously not news to anyone, um, but I think it's still important to speak aloud, especially because I'm actually not sure how many people in the audience are coming at this from a digital humanities perspective and how many people are coming from an early Americanist perspective. Um, so that by this, I mean sort of Jefferson's insistence on the ideals of the Republic, liberty, equality, opportunity, at the same time that he relied on people he enslaved like James Hemings to put those ideals on public display. Um, like I said, you know, this contradiction is not new and many, many scholars have explored it over the years. But what I'm hoping to show with this specific James Hemings and his documented artful cookery is that when you focus on Hemings and the other people to sort of quote uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, you know, who were in the room where it happened, um, how a focus on these people really opens up the story we can tell about the nation's cultural foundation. And because of how culture functioned in that particular moment in time, this in turn becomes a story about the nation's political foundation as well. So what we gain is, of course, this additional set of actors um, and actions, you know, the acts that they performed. But what I try to build up in the book is the argument that we also gain an additional set of theories about food and eating and even about aesthetic taste. Um, and then all of these together, the actors and the actions and the theories um, really help to enrich and sort of open up our understanding for us right now in the present about by whom and by what means this sort of national cultural foundation was composed. So 
I only have a couple more minutes of talking to you sort of formally, but I do want to talk a little bit more concretely about what I mean by James Hemming's contributions to this National Cultural Foundation, um, along with some of the methods that I employed in writing the book that helped me expand the significance of some of the gaps that remain in our knowledge about James Hemming's life, as well as some of the other enslaved chefs and valets and sort of other sort of culinary or culinary adjacent figures who contributed to this larger project of producing this sense of Republican taste. And then at the end, I wanna discuss just a few other examples of, in the book that illustrate some additional methods that I think that we might employ in order to sort of continue to infuse this archive with new meaning. And again, I hope this won't take me that much longer so we can actually have a discussion about this. Um, so I just wanna pick up here um, in James Hemming's life. This is in February, 1801. So this is eight years after Jefferson penned that emancipation agreement on the previous slide, but only five years after Jefferson legally granted Hemings his freedom. So there was a big period of time when they were in negotiation with each other. Um, and what you can see here is a letter written from Jefferson to a man named William Evans, who ran an inn up in Baltimore. Um, Shout out to Jessica, although I know she's not here. Um, and I'll just note that I'm uh, switching over to the digital edition of these documents for reasons that I'll explain in a minute. Um, but in any case, Jefferson wasn't particularly close to this person, um, but uh, this person's inn served as a relay point for the mail route up and down the East Coast. So the mail carrier just you know, would come there to collect letters that had been sent by people in the surrounding area or that needed to be distributed. Um, to people in the surrounding area. Um, and so this person, uh, William Evans, just had a lot of contact with a lot of people in the physical in the physical space. And so as you can see here, Jefferson references a conversation that he had had with Evans in the past. He writes, quote, you mentioned to me in conversation here that you sometimes saw my former servant James and that he made his engagements so as to keep himself always free to come to me. Could I get you the favor to send for him and tell him I shall be glad to receive him as soon as he can come to me? So Jefferson at this point was actually only two weeks away from assuming the presidency. His inauguration was going to take place on March 4th of that year. Um, and so like the, the, you know, he was like they said, like in the weeds. Um, and he actually admits as much when he apologizes to Evans. Um, this is another quote from the same letter. He says, quote, the truth is that I'm so much embarrassed in composing a good household for myself as in providing a good administration for our country. And embarrassed here just means like in the archaic sense, like experiencing difficulties. Um, so you hear, see here in Jefferson's writing, an indicator of this equivalence, this actual direct equivalence that Jefferson identified between his household and his government. So between the quality of the food that he served at his table and then the quality of the government that he intended to enact as president. And I wanna just back up a little bit to give you some context for this. I've sort of taken it for granted that all of you know that Jefferson was really into food, um, but he was. Um, he's been called the, the founding foodie, which is a term that I do not use in my book, but it's out there. Um, but just to give a few examples of this. So here is Jefferson's diagram of a macaroni machine, um, which he first encountered in Italy and then brought back with him to Monticello. Um, Here's a recipe for ice cream uh, written in Jefferson's hand. Um, he actually played a large part in popularizing ice cream in the United States because he served it so much um, at his dinners, although it was actually technically George Washington who was the first to import um, a actual ice cream maker to the United States. Um, but it wasn't just the particular foods that Jefferson ate or that he forced Hemings to prepare. It was what he felt they meant. Um, so for Jefferson, food was really emblematic of his Republican ideals. So when he was in Paris, he deliberately cultivated a variety of indigenous American ingredients in his garden there and would very ostentatiously serve them to his guests. Um, corn was one of these things. He developed a new serving style in which plates were placed directly on the table and guests could serve themselves. And this was in contrast to having meals be served by other people. And you know, there's an argument here about his desire to hide the fact that these other people were people he enslaved. But there's also like his argument that he wanted to advance was that he wanted this to represent simplicity, right? The virtuous simplicity of the nation's citizenry. Um, 
He did things like he was the first to introduce the idea of a round or sometimes oval table. Prior to that, it had just been rectangular. Um, and he also didn't have assigned seats. And so all of these gestures were intended to be symbolic, to sort of express the egalitarianism inherent in the nation's founding, and then to foster this respectful exchange of ideas across the table that would then sustain its future growth. And so all of that, these ideas come together in this meal known as the dinner table bargain, which is actually dram dramatized in Hamilton um, with the song, The Room Where It Happens. And I know, like, I feel like if you have an early American bingo card, Hamilton is now like that center square. So I apologize for making use of what is now a cliche and or sort of a contemporary uh, cultural touchstone for this. But actually, I feel like this is... Um, there's a little bit more that we could say about this. Um, so as you may or may not know, so the dinner table bargain was one of the most famous acts of political compromise in the early Republic, um, at least as Jefferson tells it, although this is kind of disputed. Um, so he invited Hamilton and John Adams to what he described as a quote, little dinner at his house. And he was hoping to resolve, there was this issue of state's debts, which he wanted to resolve without a political fight. Um, and the result about the debt issue is actually not that interesting, but one of the bargaining chips in the negotiation was the permanent location of the nation's capital. So probably the most enduring consequence of this dinner is that the capital relocated from New York City, where it was temporarily established, to what would become Washington, D.C. Um, and so Lin-Manuel Miranda incorporates all of this into his lyrics. Um, and so in the song, you hear David Diggs as Jefferson singing, quote, I arranged the meeting, I arranged the menu, the venue, the seating. Um, but as we've learned in the last several minutes, it was actually James Hemings who arranged the menu, right? And then cooked the meal that Jefferson and John Adams and Hamilton ate that night. But if we go looking for more information about Hemings' life in the archive, you know, in spite of this crucial role that he played in one of the most important episodes in the founding of the country, what we find is quite scant. Um, and this scantness has to do with Hemings' status as a Black man in the cultural context of the early United States. Um, and so if you go back to this letter that I was discussing just a few minutes ago, you'll notice that Jefferson only refers to Hemings in the letter as, quote, my former servant James, right up here. It's highlighted in green. Um, and it's only because a scholar in the 20th century who has annotated this particular letter for the published version of the Jefferson papers that that scholar knows that this particular James, um, which is a very common name, obviously, then as now, that, that James is James Hemings, um, that's the only reason that we can associate this whole letter um, to James Hemings. It is because of this work of this 20th century scholar. But if you go and you sort of say, okay, like I wanna find more, I, and you do an author search for James Hemings in the same archive, which at this point, you know, it contains, I think the Jefferson paper is what's been digitized. It's close to 50,000 documents. Um, and that's not including all of the other founders who are included in this sort of meta collection at the National Archives of the Founders Online. But in any case, you get no results. And this is because Hemings, as a man who Jefferson until only recently had held in bondage, was not a person to whom he would ever deign to actually write directly. Um, and so you can actually see this in the request that he made to Evans to quote, send for him and tell him I shall be glad to receive him. Um, and I think it's important to underscore that Jefferson insisted on making this sort of shift from print to, to oral transmission, in spite of the fact that Hemings could read and write not only in English, but only in French, right? There's no reason why Jefferson couldn't have also just sent him a letter directly. Um, and this, you know, I, I, I sort of go through this long ex exegesis in order to make the point that this is not just a failure of our limits of like what we can fit in the search bar or type in the right keywords in the browser, but it's just a striking indictment of the power relations that overdetermine the contents of our archives. What's often in shorthand as archival silence. And, you know, there are many, many articulations of this phenomenon, um, this idea of archival silence, but the most powerful still remains to me that of Michel Rolf Trio, who I know is a, a common figure in um, this reading group. Um, so, as all of you, many of you likely know, so in Silencing the Past, um, Trio wrote, writes, um, and I'm just going to read it here silences enter the process of historical production at four crucial moments. Uh, the moment of fact creation or the making of sources, the moment of fact assembly or the making of archives, and the moment of fact retrieval or the making of narratives, and then the moment of retrospective significance or the making of history in the final instance. And I think, you know, 
uh, Trulio's formulation, it's so helpful for allowing us to see in a, just a, such a clear way how silences enter the archive and why. Um, but I think even more powerfully, because of the way that it sort of atomizes the, the, the moments at which these silences enter, it also allows us to see how we might intervene, right? How we might move beyond those silences to sort of recognize the silences introduced in the historical record as a result of prior decisions about the making of sources and archives and narratives and history, and then begin the work of sort of countering those silences. And a lot of the work that I was trying to do in the book, and I'm sort of coming full circle here, was sort of contribute as I could in my own way as a literary scholar to this much larger task in which we're all collectively engaged. And with that said, I think there's an important caveat here, um, which has to do specifically with the archive of slavery um, and how that archive, as Hartman describes, it's how it's, quote, predicated upon impossibility. And I think, again, this is very familiar terrain for um, most of you here, but I think it's sort of important to, to anchor my project in this kind of thinking, because this is where I began you know, a long time ago. Um, so uh, this line is from Venus in Two Acts, right? Um, and this is the essay in which Hartman works through the difficulty of her own desire to counter the silence of the archive without at the same time committing further violence um, with any new act of narration. And Hartman, as we know, has since turned to her own method of critical fabulation, which she prefigures in this essay and then powerfully enacts in Wayward Lives. Um, and in the book, I was also thinking of scholars like Marissa Fuentes and her method of reading along the bias grain, this idea of sort of creating more elasticity within the fragments of the archive so as to expand their scholarly significance. Um, you know, I know Jessica Marie Johnson has also done this kind of work um, with thinking about the null value. Um, you know, I was trying to sort of think my way into this idea of actively working to try to make the existing archive mean as much as it possibly can. Um, and to do so by using all of the methods that I knew how to use in order to do so. And so just as sort of a, like the final section of this presentation, I wanna show briefly how I use some of these methods that actually fall under the rubric of digital humanities to perform some of this work with respect to James Hemmings. And I just wanna say here, my goal was again, sort of not to redress his absence from the archive, but rather to try to attest in new ways to what we knew about his life or did not know about his life um, and his community and his kin. So what you're looking at here is something called a correspondence network. It's a diagram of people like William Evans, uh, to whom Jefferson wrote or from whom Jefferson received letters. Um, and I've limited this just to the letters that were about James Hemings. And I compiled this network data by searching the archives and notes for instances of James Hemings, then converting um, their sort of infer the date format into the format required for network analysis. Um, and most of the connections are logically explained, um, but the really interesting thing is that when you actually, you know, count up the number of letters exchanged between Jefferson and Evans, um, you actually discover that he is, plays a much more active presence than you might initially think. And evidently, when you track down sort of these different, the sort of the, the chain of letters, um, Hemings, Hemings had already been involved in negotiations for employment with Jefferson well before Jefferson sought Evans' help. Um, and I think, you know, having spent the four, the first, you know, he was 25 at that point, he spent 25 years of his life as an enslaved man. And Hemings likely understood the importance of just defining the terms of his employment in advance, you know, before he committed to go back to Jefferson. So what you can see here is that he's requesting through another acquaintance that Jefferson, quote, sent him a few lines of engagement and on what conditions and what wages Jefferson would please to give him. And then he further specifies that the offer should be in Jefferson's, quote, own handwriting. Um, this is him demonstrating his own awareness of the power of print, and in particular, the power of Jefferson's personal hand, as at that point, president-elect, to stand in for the effect of sort of the de jure agreement as that his status as a black man, even a free black man, precluded him from ever wielding to its full effect. So for reasons unknown, Jefferson failed to comply with this request. Um, and so the next letter in the archive is from Evans back to Jefferson, and it documents Hemings' confident tone. Um, we don't know exactly what Hemings says, 
But Evans reports to Jefferson, quote, the answer he returned to me was that he would not go to Washington unless you should write to him yourself. So here we get this really powerful confirmation of Hemings' literacy, his business acumen, his determined stance. But despite its importance, this letter doesn't appear in the results of a search for James Hemings because the editors have not marked it as referring to Hemings as they did in the previous letter. Um, and so unless you're sort of able to trace back this path of connections, you don't turn up this letter at all. But whether or not Evans influenced the outcome of the situation, the archive just doesn't tell us. Um, Hemings never became chef at the White House. There's actually an eight month gap in the correspondence between Jefferson and Hemings. And then the next and the final exchange, which is from November of that year, confirms what Evans describes as quote, the melancholy circumstance of Hemings suicide. So to return to the Hartman quote I had up on the screen a few minutes ago, um, you know, the story of James Hemming is sort of like yet another instance of the story that she's describing here. It's predicated upon a impossibility. So to tell the story involves listening for the unsaid, translating these misconstrued words and refashioning disfigured lines. Um, and in, again, intent on achieving an impossible goal, which is this idea of redressing the violence of slavery that produced, in Hartman's case, the, the records that she's dealing with of numbers and ciphers and fragments. And in Hemings' case, you know, these accounts that just hint at everything that was going on in his life that we will never know. And I think, you know, we obviously we do not have that. And, and arguably, we should not have access to all of that. And so the question that I then asked myself at this point was whether it was possible to visualize this impossibility, right? And then as a secondary question, you know, is this a task that we should under, sort of be undertaking at all? And, you know, Hartman in this particular essay, she laments the fact that she has not dis yet discovered a way of dis sort of what she described as dearranging the archive um, so that it can recall a person's life or present a, a truer, clearer picture. And as we know, she would go on to pursue this task in the decade that followed, culminating in Wayward Lives, which came out just as I was finishing this book. And, you know, some of the figure, figures who Hartman focuses on are the women who encountered W.E.B. Du Bois as he conducted the data collection for the report that would become the Philadelphia Negro. Um, and so recently I've been thinking a lot about the additional connections between how Hartman provides these stories behind the data visualizations in that report and how sort of along a parallel, I mean, I would say like very much following, not, not parallel, like equal, um, but how I sort of was attempting to use, sort of do like a complementary task, use data visualization as a way of opening up the space for the stories that might in the future be told. And so this is what brought me to the second network diagram that I created. Um, and so rather than representing the people writing and receiving letters like the previous one, it shows the people mentioned in the same sets of letters. So people like the, you know, like James, like, you know, by a single name James um, that I began my story with. And I think here um, most significantly, you know, the arcs that link Jefferson to the men and women he enslaved, they're much more prominent than those that link him to his family members and his friends, which suggests the heightened degree to which Jefferson relied on these people to enact his various directives, right? Um, so you can think back to that request that uh, Jefferson made to have the apple sent to him while he was in France packed in these layers of moss or the provisions for his table, you know? And in this way, I think the visualization conjures a sense of the scope of Jefferson's dependence on these men and women in order to advance his Republican project. And this remains true even as we can't recreate what these people said in their conversations, um, either with Jefferson or with each other, um, where they went to conduct their various transactions or anything about how they truly lived their everyday lives. So what I was trying to do with this image instead is represent the archive as you know, something that is moving um, something that is animated and that can sort of expand when motion and feeling are infused back in, rather than representing the archive as something that's like static or fixed that sort of reinscribes this uh, sort of ethic of loss. So I'm almost done with my formal remarks. I know I've said this a couple of times and this went on longer than I thought it would, but it turns out I have a lot to say. Um, 
So I just want to talk very, very briefly about one more and maybe two of these unrecorded stories that I consider in the book and then the methods that I use, which are emphatically not digital, um, in order to try to reanimate them. Um, and the first is that of Melinda Russell, who is currently believed to be the first Black woman to author a cookbook in the United States. Um, so her archival trace is almost like the mirror image of James, James Hemming. So unlike his story, which you can sort of stitch together through these mentions and the correspondence of others, the, the only thing that we know about Russell is this two-page story that she tells herself. Um, her cookbook begins with a short autobiography that you can see. Um, and so you get a lot of information about her and her life um, and leading up to the fact of how she uh, published her cookbook um, by herself. It was self-published in 1866. Um, but then the question remains for the scholar, like if this is the only thing that we have, just this cookbook with this page and a half of autobiography, how do we make this cookbook mean something more? And so what I do in that chapter of the book is to think long and hard about the, what a cookbook is intended to do, um, who it's intended to be used by, and then who it's intended to benefit. And then I end up with what I think is my favorite theoretical argument in the book about how Russell intended her recipes to elicit satisfaction. Um, and in this chapter, I try to build out an argument about Russell's theory of satisfaction as a counterpoint to the dominant discourse of taste. Um, so the dom this dominant discourse is the one that structured Jefferson and Hemings' relationship and encapsulated so much about the dominant Republican ideology of the time. But can we think our way outside of that discourse, right? And that's what this chapter tries to do. And as the book unfolds, folds, um, I try to sort of move from these narrow constraints of the dominant Republican ideology to try to sort of imagine otherwise to sort of trace alternatives through the archive. And there are some other examples that we can talk about more and I would be happy to do so, including this one about the, the image that's on the cover of the book. But I think that I'll end there um, and just thank you for listening. And I'm just really interested to hear your thoughts and your questions and your comments. Oh, and also uh, I will put this in the chat, but if you're curious about buying the book, there's a 40% off coupon um, from UMP. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, can I ask you to remove your screen share? Yeah. Hi, everybody. So, so thank you, that was wonderful. Um, so I think we, we have a, uh, a small and cozy group enough that we can make this uh, more of a conversation so that feel you can feel free to like ask follow-ups and even like let's uh, uh, engage in conversation. We don't have to make sure that everybody who raises their hand gets one question in, which, uh, uh, which is uh, sometimes a concern when you have larger groups. So it's a Saturday, nice outside. And I think Lauren is amenable to having a conversation of all of us. So, um, uh, so, uh, while you start formulating your question, I, I can get us started. I can get the conversation started, but uh, uh, feel free to uh, write your question down on, on the comments, on the chat, or raise your hand. And then I, I, will, I will call on you and put on a spotlight on you and you can ask uh, Lauren a question or engage in conversation uh, with Lauren uh, um, uh, on the book. So Lauren, uh, thank you so much. I don't, I, I don't know if you, we didn't have a chance to, to to talk about this, but I don't know if uh, you had a chance to read uh, Jessica Johnson's uh, uh, um, book. Uh, I think you are, I, I would assume you're familiar a little bit with her null value yep. uh, argument. Um, yeah, and, and sadly she couldn't join us, Jessica couldn't uh, join us uh, uh, today. Um, but I st I'm starting to see this kind of uh, uh, sort of concern from, from those in our generation who are starting to, who do this kind of uh, archival historical work, but also starting to engage with uh, these technologies and doing this digital humanities. Uh, these kind of trying to do these uh, uh, approaches that, that echo uh, uh, the Hartman, the Fuentes, et cetera, where we're trying ourselves to wrestle with, the, with, with these absences in the archives in a field that values presence, that, that values the data that's available. And, uh, and this is uh, something that you're very familiar with. And one of the problems that we have, and you pointed it out in your presentation, is that of course there's, there's people around here that uh, want to kind of reconstruct the subject, the missing subject using only data. Like, uh, so, and, and I'm thinking of the uh, uh, latest Mellon grant uh, that uh, for using linked open data, with the voyages uh, data that will connect it to archives all around the country in order to reconstruct this subject so that if you put like a name in the in the search then all of a sudden like all the information about that subject uh will appear and the danger there is of course that we assume this is like oh we're reconstructing lives all of a sudden 
uh, enslaved lives. So all of a sudden they just like magically reconstruct just because the linked open data connects uh, these lives. Uh, and, and of course, every time I hear this being described, I, I think of that Tupac Shakur, you know, like uh, the, the hologram of Tupac Shakur and how creepy that was. I know exactly what you're talking. <laughs> and, and like how wrong it just sounds to do this kind of work. And I think your work will be one of the ones that will be useful as an antidote along with Jessica's and others. Uh, uh, and I was wondering if you, if, uh, if you could say a little bit more about how this work inserts itself, not in American studies, but in this, the construction of the future archives that we're doing right now. Um, as, as we are like literally building these digital infrastructures. Uh, if you could say a little bit more, because that would, the way our students will study the past, uh, the, uh, the, of, uh, the slavery archive of the future will be hybrid, right? Digital and analog. So if you could say a little bit more about, about, about that, how you see your own work uh, affecting it. Yeah, I mean, like in some ways, this is sort of the question, right? So we could talk about this for a long time, but I think that, you know, one of the real ethical questions that I think is sort of is characteristic of the field, and I like I wasn't intending actually when I put this presentation together to like pin everything on Hartman, but I do feel like for a generation of scholars, like she has been such a, a beacon and a lodestone and sort of ahead of or everyone else sort of in trying to work through like with an emphasis on the through like these issues that we encounter as scholars who work in this era, you know, and I think in many ways like because her career sort of you know, tracks ours, but ahead, like, you know, I read scenes of subjection in grad school. I came across Venus and Tuvex as I was writing in my dissertation, Wayward Lives came out, you know, so it's like this question of, you know, what do we do, right? Like we are, our archive, the archive, you know, speaking generally and conceptually is fundamentally flawed and and in irrecoverable. I mean, we can't change what we have. And yet we need pathways that let us do something generative um, with the material that we do have to sort of take it and redirect it or reframe it so that it can do more that it's doing than just as it exists in the sort of artifactual object, right? And I think that's really the challenge of, and I think, you know, it required time in order to arrive at that approach. And I honestly think that, you know, there are legitimate reasons to reject that approach. Like, I think that I had to think, especially like as a white scholar who deals with the archive of slavery, like, what am I doing here, you know? And I wanted to be very intentional with my actions to ask myself, like, I'm spending so much time with these materials. What is my goal, sort of, what conversation am I contributing to and to who must I remain accountable to in the end? And I think that, you know, I decided pretty early in the process that, what I thought I could do was sort of activate some of these contents in a new way in order to sort of like tell some new stories, you know? And again, in the very beginning when I said, I'm not a historian, um, I'm less invested in sort of reconstituting, um, you know, or sort of elevating the significant, I'm actually gonna grossly mischaracterize the field of history. So I apologize for all the historians listening in, but I feel like, you know, I really feel like what I, what I can contribute is narrative. Right, like I can take a figure in the archive and help sort of make, you know, make a James Hemings be commensurate with a Thomas Jefferson. And it's like, I am the one who needs to do that because otherwise you're comparing 50,000 documents to five. And that's just not, you know, in like a database search, that's not a commensurate comparison, even though in my view, those two people are exactly like, directly commensurate. And if anything, Jefferson, I mean, uh, Hemings, you know, should get more of the credit than Jefferson did for most of, especially with respect to food, right? Um, and so I think this is just sort of a long way of saying that we're at this place now, both in uh, sort of humanities scholarship, but also in the creation of digital archives, where we need to be asking ourselves these questions, right? Which is like, what are we doing with this material? What is our goal? We understand that the end point is not just putting it out there, right? But it's going to be examined and searched and recirculated and taken out of context on the context that we intended. And so we need to think really, really hard about sort of what those contexts might be. And I think, you know, just to sort of wrap this up, like I think the transatlantic slave trade database is a really interesting and complicated example because some people, individuals, like really do want that linked database 
they're going to read their family's history, right? And so that part is really valuable. Like if you're like, I want to find information about my family, it becomes immensely valuable to be able to connect that data, right? But if you are not a person who has that personal or contextual relationship to the material and those, you know, the human lives that it documents, the effect can be exactly the reverse, right? Instead of like, you know, somehow miraculously reconstituting this chain of connection, just making it seem like, you know, like people, uh, making people seem like data, which in a way just, not in a way, like actually does sort of replicate the original process of enslavement, right? Um, and so, and I'm not sure, I mean, I think that the, the transatlantic slave trade database, I know Jessica has also written about this a lot more and has a lot smarter things to say about it than I do. Um, but I think they're thinking, they're trying to think about that context and sort of how you provide enough contextual information so that these databases and the information about people um, that is recorded as data is sort of perceived by anyone who encounters it as that, right? Not just a connection or a data point, but as a record of a life that is, you know, at this point abstracted into that particular value, but needs to be understood in the broader context. Um, but maybe I'll just stop there. Uh oh, you're muted. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, you know, I, I could go on talking about this all day, but uh, I'm going to now uh, give uh, room to others uh, to ask Lauren a question. Uh, I see, I don't see anyone uh, raising their hands. We have a, a shy group today. Uh, we have one hand, Claire. All right, Claire, you wanna unmute yourself? Here. Hi, thank you first so much for this book. I really enjoyed it and really enjoyed reading it. I'm wondering if you have, any plans to engage with the public with some of the themes from your book, either by publishing your lovely um, data visualization and expanding on that a little bit, or engaging with some of the public memory of, I think there are some groups right now that like study food history and try to connect back to James Hem Hemings and to some of the legacies of slavery and food history? Yeah, that's a really good question. Alex and I were actually just talking about this earlier. So there is this James Hemings Society, um, which Alex has a family member who is peripherally involved with, um, which is a, um, a total small world connection, which I did not know about. Um, but I will say that I think that that's really important. And one of the, you know, one of the choices that I made in the book was not to take that path. Um, in part because it's such a sort of expansive path for future inquiry. And like in the classes, when I teach this material, I do have my students both talk about their own sort of food memories and food histories. And then I have them cook some of the historical recipes, which is actually quite difficult to do because they're, the conventions are not yet established. And then that sort of prompts a discussion, um, both about sort of culinary expertise, but also um, sort of the, uh, tacit knowledge and what is lost and things like this. Um, you know, I, I would love to be more involved in these public conversations. I've been in dialogue a little bit with Michael Twitty, um, who, you know, who, it's interesting, like he uses very, you know, a lot of the same archival contents as I do, because the truth is that if you're studying food and eating in, especially in the early Republic, this pretty narrow period, there's just not that much stuff. And so everyone who works on this area uses the same handful of figures and documents. Um, but his pathway um, was absolutely to sort of personalize it. And he traces these documents and these figures back to his own family. Um, he ends up cooking a lot of, and uh, a lot of these dishes, he actually like goes and harvests cotton in order to feel like what it was like um, and writes about this from a personal perspective. And I find that really, really powerful. Um, and then I've also been thinking about too, um, the flip side of this sort of, again, from this perspective of like, well, like, like what, can, what can I do, right? Like here I'm this like, you know, fancy pants scholar and, you know, sitting in my, it, my desk chair on a Saturday, you know, on Zoom, speaking with other scholars about, you know, it's like, I, like, I and this audience is like pretty far removed from, you know, like the public broadly conceived. And I do feel like one of the things that um, I have tried to do and would like to do 
try to sort of bring more public attention to this question of archival silence and sort of not just what we can learn, but also what we can't learn and why it's important to sort of hold the space for those, you know, the loss that inheres in the archive, right? And order, and I think, because I think again, like, you know, we in this room have a pretty sophisticated vocabulary for discussing the sort of the tensions between like what we know and what we can quote and what we can document. And then the things that we like, our minds tell us should be true, but we don't have textual or historical evidence to confirm them. Um, but I think that, you know, in general, like people are looking to learn concrete things about the past, right? And it's hard sometimes to say like, what you need to learn is that we don't know certain things. Um, and we sort of need to hold the space in our knowledge to say like, there's reasons why we don't know these things, right? And the reason is because this labor was unvalued or undervalued. It was performed by enslaved people who themselves were not valued and our national, like sort of the national cultural archive, um, you know, has for so long privileged like these founding fathers, right? Um, and so that's sort of something that I would really like to do is draw out some of these, these gaps or absences. Thank you. Uh, Ana Lucia, you have a question? Yes. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Uh, this, is, um, this is really um, an, in, an important book in, in terms of uh, the, 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 the methods that he used and the approach that he used that for us historians is, um, uh, opens up uh, new perspectives. One of the issues that I ask myself, uh, I, I think I have three, three elements that I would like to ask you. First of all, uh, th this focus that you put on this, uh, the, this founding fathers, then uh, Jefferson and Washington and uh, those who worked for them uh, cooking. Uh, then uh, even for us who have been studying the, the history and memory of uh, these two founding fathers and how slavery operates in all of this, uh, sometimes it's a little bit tricky because uh, these were enslaved people, but they were part of the elite of the enslaved people who uh, were in bondage and owned by uh, Jefferson and Washington and uh, others. And the act of eating is also not only something that Jefferson and Washington were doing, but enslaved people, they, all, they were also eating. And um, I, I ask myself, how does it work? Because we, of course we mention a lot, and this is something I've been repeating uh, uh, here in the, um, the book club. Uh, we mention a lot of this issue of the, the silences. But uh, it appears that uh, when you are looking at Jefferson or Washington, uh, there, is, there is still a lot of material regarding how these elites uh, were eating. And still we have archives uh, in France or in Britain and so on. Then I ask myself about uh, the, the, the problem of how the majority of the population in early uh, United States uh, was eating and from where we can uh, get, uh, I would say, traces of uh, these actions. Then, of course, you conceive the archive uh, from a traditional point of view that is the archive, the written archive. There is that archive that left um, um, written traces. But when you are talking about food, uh, this archive can be uh, as you mentioned, the work of Tweedy, this archive can be in the communities that are still today cooking as their uh, ancestors did. And especially when you were talking about the populations of African descent uh, in the early America, that is still in your case, then of course, uh, 18th century, this is a period when Africans were still arriving in, in North America. And I ask myself, what is this place of, uh, uh, of African food, African food ways in this uh, food that, uh, or this uh, practices of eating that, um, that you are examining? Uh, 
then this would be um, would be my questions. Then the issue of uh, who is eating then the enslaved people that were the majority that are not visible in in the archives. The problem of examining enslaved people that were the elite enslaved people, and finally the 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 place uh, of Africa uh, in all of this. That's such a good question. And I mean, I think the short version is like, you're right about every single thing that you said, right? Um, you know, this is a project that I think is constrained by its focus on textual artifacts, on some notion of the literary that sort of was inherited from like my graduate training, right? Um, and certainly circumscribed by a pretty narrow conception of the United States. And actually there was a point in the project when I had to ask myself, <clears throat> do I want to expand this beyond the sort of the physical constraints of the continent, right? Like, should this become a, a sort of more Atlantic world, world project? And I decided at that point uh, not to do so. And I think if I were starting the project again, I probably would have made different choices. You know, one of the things I, you know, I, because I was aware that I was not addressing exactly the issues that you name, I did try to talk a little bit about it in the final chapter where I bring in Colson Whitehead's The Underground Railroad. And one of the things that I think that he does, which is really interesting is that, so he, um, he draws from Harriet Jacobs narrative and takes a lot of the sort of plot points from her narrative, narrative in order to give the, his own plot, which is fictional, um, sort of its direction. But the other thing that he does is that he weaves into the narrative all of these elements that you're describing. Um, so he has his protagonist, whose name is Cora, um, while she is still enslaved, tend her own little plot of garden um, and has her planting like okra and um, squash and does make these connections to people in her family who have sort of told her that she can grow these things and these things will taste good. And one of the real, and I, in the book, I actually try to sort of draw out what this means that contemporary scholars know this and can sort of put it back into the textual record um, by essentially like enriching, you know, enriching a narrative count as we would do it now with all of this information about these really rich food colors, food cultures, um, that were not in the print record. Um, and I try to contrast sort of what Whitehead is doing, the sort of like infusing of the additional non-textual archival research with essentially the Harriet Jacobs narrative, which doesn't include any of the stuff, right? Because Jacobs charge was like, you know, write about your enslavement, convince the white abolitionists to, you know, change their minds kind of thing. Um, and I don't do it enough. I mean, you're totally right about that. And the question as to whether or not I'm sort of reinscribing the absence and sort of like the, the class striations, right, by undertaking this project is a good one. And I think I'll have to sit with that a little bit more. Um, but I think that like to, to your point earlier, you know, like I have, I've, 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 did, I've been thinking about it. Thank you. Yeah, if, it, if I can follow up so that we can, um pulling at that thread a little bit, because I think one of the things that makes your book already, I think, wonderful is, is how, how interdisciplinary and, and how many methods you actually bring to bear. And of course, this will push the, uh, the, the research or, or people who will follow up on your book. Uh, uh, this kind of conversation pushes people who will follow up on your work, whether that's you or somebody else, in even more directions, right? Because I can think of, for example, from a Marxist per perspective, one would want to look at uh, uh, what does the production look like, enslaved uh, and otherwise, in the way that it's affecting what actually makes it to to Monticello, for Hemings to cook it for 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 these dudes, and um, and also like, like like I'm still like I tried really hard while reading your book trying to connect that to then how did fat food fat food uh, fast food nation and food deserts and all these other things that we know is like our food culture today. Like what is the connection between this kind of like clear like your world's very the world you describe in the beginning of like end of 18th century beginning 19th century kind of comes alive right and the way you do it in the book and it's kind of like you get a sense of what the food culture is there but then i'm like trying to like fill in the gaps between that and like this surrealist bizarro world of food that we have right now you know uh and i met I imagine you probably have better ideas about what those steps are in between uh, than, than i do but i wonder if you if, if you thought about that like 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 uh yeah go ahead. 
Yeah, I mean, I've, I've thought about this a lot because, you know, the narrative in food, the contemporary food culture didn't really emerge until the 20th century and was sort of accelerated by World War II and industrialization. And like, it, it, it really frames it as a contemporary phenomenon. The, the standard narrative is like, well, actually most people ate pretty okay in the, the geographical physical United States because there was a lot of food around. Um, it didn't necessarily taste good, but they didn't really care. Um, they weren't hungry. And, um, and they just sort of continued along this pace until there was, rise in immigration and different food cultures. And there are some interesting arguments about sort of having to mark whiteness in certain ways in relationship to other sort of uh, other white immigrant cultures like Italian food, Polish food, things like this. Um, and so you do get some literature like that, but there is really a gap um, in people trying to connect where we are now to where we were then. I mean, I think where I would, um, try to draw some parallels is in two ways. One is this idea that there has always been, in spite of the claim that like, you know, people always ate whatever, whenever, and they didn't really think about it because they were full kind of argument. Like there always is a cultural and social valence to whatever it is that we eat always, whether it has, it's sort of about our families or our communities or, um, you know, some larger social or cultural group that we view ourselves as a part of. And so that's always there. Um, and I think if anything, you know, this the sort of, it probably is less difficult than food scholars might think to connect some of these trends, like on the one hand with this sort of um, like obsessive, organic, you know, fancy kind, you know, whatever the, the, like the fancy food is like, you can probably connect that back to Jefferson pretty easily. Um, and people ne not ne sort of necessarily haven't really done the work. And at the same time, I would say you can probably also, and actually people have done this kind of work trying to sort of theorize like both fast food and McDonald's in exactly the same lines, right? Like these are different versions of the same thing, which is this desire um, either in, by the people in power, um, or by communities themselves, depending on sort of who was able to make these choices, like have this particular food culture tied to certain assumptions about what the larger culture, what is represented in the larger culture. Um, you know, there's actually, there's some work on the emergence of McDonald's that actually is like, actually, um, the McDonald'sification of the country was a very deliberate cultural move. And that was before fast food was reviled, it was uh, sort of uh, uplifted as the way in which American food should be because it was fast, efficient, everywhere, all the same. And this sort of like homogenizing kind of impulse actually reflected what people were after in that time um, in that culture. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Gretchen, uh, uh, and then after that, a question in the in the chat from uh, Ashley. So, so uh, Gretchen, you want to unmute yourself? I'm gonna uh, spotlight yeah. you right now. Good. Um, thank you so much. Those uh, I just was taking so many notes during your presentation, and I can't wait to to read the book. I'm embarrassed I haven't I haven't got my hands on it. Um, sort of to to follow up a little bit on what Anna Lucia was saying about gaps. I was really struck how this is, this conversation is, is about two, is, or not even conversation, but these sort of polls of James Hemings and Thomas Jefferson as two men, when most of the cooking in early America and, and, and in present day America is done by, by women. And I'm wondering, and I'm, as Alex was talking about Harriet Jacobs, you know, I'm remembering that her grandmother right, like sold baked goods and things. Um, and that's how she was able to support herself and, and other people too. And I'm wondering, does that, I mean, I haven't read the book, but I wonder if that's a gap that you explore and if that, and how that kind of overlays onto the sort of elite, non-elite, because I imagine it's mostly elite people that have a man cooking for them, um, or just if, just a sort of pulling on that thread a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate that question. And, you know, it's like, it's, it, I was saying to Alex, like this book is, you know, it started as my dissertation. And I think all dissertation books are sort of a, a, a record of your own education and sort of how you come to see as much as they are 
you know, what the book ends up being. And so as the book, I mean, I think this was something that I became increasingly aware of as I was writing the book. And the later chapters, actually, I do talk about um, Harry Jacobs from the baking as sort of a frame for understanding Jacob's own awareness of sort of what could be accomplished on her own and essentially what required capital um, and, and also food because at time, you know, I mean, there's also parts in the incidents where she talks about really, and many of you likely know this, where like she doesn't get enough food because she's enslaved, but her grandmother who runs the bakery has more food. And so she goes routinely to her grandmother's front door and the grandmother feeds her and so she's okay, right? Um, and so that's like this very real um, reflection of why this matters. The, I would say the chapter where I get at this the most is actually in the third chapter on Melinda Russell, um, who is the cookbook author who I mentioned briefly um, at the end of my presentation, because one of the things, again, that sort of, like I said, sort of, I became increasingly aware of as I was working through the, or thinking through the process of writing the book is that the concept of taste itself is so elitist and exclusionary that if you are working within that frame, you're only sort of gonna turn up, I mean, the best you can do is find additional evidence of more people being tasteful, you know? And it's like, well, is that really the goal? To be like, no, everyone was tasteful, you know? I mean, that in a way is sort of an unsatisfying or a less interesting or even important argument than saying, well, what were other people thinking about with their cooking who, not only were excluded from the sort of dominant worldview, but want, wanted nothing to do with the dominant worldview, right? And so I talk about Melinda Russell in terms of this idea of satisfaction. So she, in her autobiography, in the beginning of, the, um, of her cookbook, talks a lot about how her cooking earned her money. And this money, she was able to sort of it's sort of like the, the act that she could be sort of self supporting herself, self-sufficient, not reliant on other people, um, and then in turn take care of other people um, was incredibly satisfying for her. And I sort of try to spin out this idea that, you know, taste is so much the sort of individualistic mode of like all the change needs to happen within yourself. Um, and the idea is like other people will undergo the same inner process next to you and have like a parallel internal transformation. So in the end, as it turns out, you, you all like the same things and then that makes it convenient for democracy, right? Um, but if you start from a place where the goal is sort of situating yourself within a, either a community or even an economic environment in which everyone sort of plays a role in sustaining each other. Um, there are sort of other ways to think about aesthetic expression that are outside of the sort of individualistic sort of self-improving kind of way. Um, and lo and behold, like it is, you know, a lot more women who I think are thinking about these types of things, um, these questions about both like the, cultivation and the limits of cultivation, you know, whereas um, the taste philosopher sort of, you know, which is both like a feature and a bug, they did believe that everyone could cultivate themselves to sort of a standard of taste, right? And for them, this was kind of reassuring, but it remained unchallenged. And then other people outside of this were like, these people are not cultivated, you know, they're enslaving, they're despicable humans, right? You know, whatever you're talking about in terms of cultivation or taste, that is actually not a concept that holds any weight to me from where I sit sort of outside of this. And so I, you know, I actually do wish, I, I really wanted to put that chapter first in the book because I like so much what it does, but it was just like the, I sort of wanted to adhere to the, the chronological format and also sort of the development of my thinking. But you, I know this is just sort of a long and rambly way of saying that like you raised really important points that there's definitely more thinking to be done um, about these. Thank you, and I think we have a question in the chat. Ashley, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your, uh, your question? Yes, thank you so much. I was gonna say to Miss uh, Gretchen, don't feel bad. I, I just found out about the Zoom today, but I will be getting the book um, because this is definitely a topic of interest for me. Uh, my question was, uh, I am someone interested in pursuing uh, my PhD, but if someone like myself was interested in pursuing this subject matter uh, and wanted to earn their PhD in that area, uh, what would be the area of focus per se? And uh, are there any programs or schools that you could recommend? Um, do it. 
do it. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I honestly, I feel like the discipline has changed. I mean, you know, early, early American literature kind of lags as a field. I know there's some people on this call, Jonathan, I'm looking at you who would, who would maybe take issue with that. But I do feel like, you know, in the 15th speech, between when I started this project and now, like there is a lot more space even within English PhD programs for this type of work. And I think honestly, thanks to the work of other scholars, there's examples of, you know, what this work looks like. Um, you know, that said, I feel like the, the sort of the nexus of all of the things that I do has always felt more like American studies. Um, and in particular programs with strong food sort of training and food studies, I think UT Austin has a core group of faculty uh, sort of working around here. Um, I'm trying to think of other places. I mean, uh, the UC schools, uh, UC, I think, uh, I'm trying to think which UC school has a food studies program. Uh, maybe someone else knows this. Um, but if you look around, you can sort of find these pockets. But I would say, you know, the, the field of food studies for sure needs more scholars willing to stretch beyond sort of how food study scholarship has been done in the past in order to show how there can be sort of a more capacious version of it. And it is absolutely like a more speculative and more embodied, more anchored in the wide range of artifacts, certainly not textual, um, that exist to us in order to sort of bring together in the stories that we want to tell. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan, did you want to add something to that? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I put this in the chat, but I would agree that early American studies is um, kind of behind the curve on a lot of these things. And I think there's also, just uh, you mentioned the history versus English, and I think there's sometimes a kind of uh, internecine struggle between history and which I think literature people are much more aware in early American lit versus early American history. But there's, I think, a kind of conservatism that you see if there was a dialogue involving some uh, native study scholars um, and some and David Silverman, and basically the, uh, you know, this idea of the sort of out and out rejection of indigenous studies is something that American studies uh, should be concerned with. This is in the Journal of American History. I'm, I'm oversimplifying for the purpose of, of uh, the conversation. Uh, I will mention, I mentioned this to uh, Ms. Gardner, but Spellman right in Atlanta has a, 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 it seems like a pretty robust undergraduate food studies program, which doesn't address the question directly, but it's something, um, it seems like there's there are exciting things happening there. I didn't know that actually. Wow, I'm gonna go track that down right now. Yeah, I, I, um, I, let me, I'll throw the link in the chat. Um, Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Vanessa, you wanna step in? Uh, sure. Um, of course, uh, this book makes me think of a number of different things and your presentation um, sparked a number of avenues and questions. Um, I did my undergraduate work um, sort of near uh, where Jefferson uh, lived and did a lot of this uh, cult cultivating of his tastes. Um, and your work immediately made me think of Vincent Woodard's uh, work um, in The Delectable Negro, uh, because of course Jefferson's not just cultivating a taste for food or trying to present, I mean, he's really trying to present, you know, a whole menu of manners, you know, for Americans to imitate. Um, but he also is cultivating a particular taste um, for slavery. Um, and it, you know, despite his many denials, um, and I think about, um, I had a friend in undergrad who actually did material culture work um, and worked at the hearth at Monticello um, and did a lot to recover, like the actual physical processes of, you know, processing food, preparing food, that sort of thing. Um, and it's really heavy labor in the period. <laughs> um, and it would be hard to imagine that some of the sweat of enslaved people, right? Some of them didn't end up somewhere in all of this food in a very literal sense, not just in like a kind of figurative way. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit um, about really kind of like the range of types of consumption that are happening here, that it's, it is 
food, but but it, it it's always so much more when enslaved hands are are preparing it. Absolutely, yeah. I'm glad you brought up uh, Vincent Woodward's work and also this idea of like actual like the the bodies and the I don't know what you would call the sweat, you know, but like this. I talk about this a little bit in the chapter. I have a little section on uh, Mary Randolph and the Virginia housewife. Um, this is actually connected to your larger point about it cultivating a taste for slavery, sort of the, or the the Jefferson and Madison, that you know these figures, are part of what they were doing is cultivating a uh, acceptability to continue enslaving others, right, through this this idea of eating. Um, and so two things to say, you know, to sort of the different, maybe I'll speak to sort of the two sides of the range that I talk about in the book. Um, you know, the argument that I find really powerful is one made by Psyche Williams Forson about how the people and predominantly women in the kitchen, even when sort of overseen by these, um, the the white mistress of the house types who would come with their recipes and say like make this for me um it was usually they usually the actual people the enslaved women doing the cooking made the food taste good in spite of these usually pretty awful recipes because the people in charge of the house did, like they never they never actually cooked so they had no idea what they were doing right so these recipes essentially had very little uh generate like productive use because they didn't correspond to the actual people or the knowledge of the people doing the work. And so uh, Williams Forson makes the case that like whenever there is something on record as like, you know, the, the person, the white enslaver saying like, oh, this came from my kitchen and it tasted good. That is a testament to the knowledge and experience of the people cooking it, that they made it taste good in spite of whatever directives they had received that they were ostensibly supposed to follow. Um, and I find that like both very compelling and rings very true to me. And it also speaks to sort of your larger point about what taste is doing here as essentially authorizing um, the persistence of slavery. And one of the things that I, I track a little bit through the book is how the, especially people like Jefferson and Madison and Mary Randolph, who all enslaved people themselves, like they are very, aware and intent on uh, widening the distinction between food and taste or between eating and taste. So as much as they saw eating as like symbolic and an important act that would cultivate taste, ultimately the end point of that was to, to widen the gulf so that they could, they could sort of emerge as the tasteful ones and the people doing the cooking would not have been cultivated by that same process. And it was tricky, right? Because what I was saying before is that the underlying assumption, and this is something that's a problem with, you know, like all enlightenment thought is that there are these claims made about the universality of certain behaviors or abilities or capabilities, you know, mostly coming from the Scottish enlightenment philosophers and things like this. So they have like, you know, capital M man. It's like Alex Waheli's argument, right? Um, and yet, as soon as they say like anyone can do this, they say, well, we don't actually mean anyone, we just mean white male citizen subjects, right? And so this idea of taste is really problematic for them because the first, the claim is like anyone can become cultivated. This is very reassuring for them because they're like, oh, especially in the US, they've just shifted to a representative democracy. How can we know that people will make appropriate political decisions? Oh, well, everyone will mostly end up kind of the same, right? Um, and yet they do not want to admit the possibility that black people can be cultivated exactly the same as white people can, because that would be very problematic for their notion of democracy, right? Because then they'd have to include them. Um, and so they end up having to, because of essentially this like fundamental, um, like logical fallacy in their philosophy, enforce this distinction in other ways, you know, because obviously, if you are the person preparing the food that is overdetermined with all these symbolic values, of course, you know that it's tasteful. Of course, you are the one who shapes it. Like, of course, you are the most tasteful of among any of these guys, right? And yet, the founders were unwilling to let that happen. They were in, unwilling to let these black chefs into the sort of white um, ruling class, the ruling tasteful class. And so they did this, you know, legally, they did this hegemonically. I mean, they did that all the ways that we know. Um, but I think that eating is a really interesting example of this because, you know, the, 
like I said before, like you can't, you can't look at it without knowing because we all eat every, like we all, all of us eat, we know what this is. Um, you can't look at this experience and from the present and not see how it is true that if like whatever claims made to tastefulness are universal in this case, and especially are exemplified by the people making the food. Yeah, I um I think, you know, this this I am reminded of another college story. I had two friends in college. One was grew up in Pittsburgh and the other is from a um a, a long standing Virginia family. Um and they were talking about a dishwasher. Um and well into the it took well into the conversation of them to realize that the friend from Virginia was talking about a person and the friend from Pittsburgh was talking about a machine. Um, and both were shocked that the other had a dishwasher um, growing up. Um, and I think, you know, about Alex's question about, you know, our uh, fast food wasteland, but a, a lot of what's also being cultivated is the convenience, um, right? That, that it's this labor that you don't have to do um, and just appears magically. Jefferson found all sorts of ways for his food to appear magically on his table. Um, and, uh, as Anna brought up, the, the people often serving it were not, were, were also tastefully cultivated to be sure that it's like the right sort of enslaved person who's there in person versus who's behind the lazy Susan, who's hauling the kettles of water, who's rolling barrels of water up a hill to Monticello every day. Um, when I had one follow up um, because there's, there's a lot of room here for enslaved resistance. Um, kitchens are, I talk about in my own work, kitchens are hubs of activity all day long. They're important command centers. Um, but food, food way, and foodways um, are incredible sites of resistance. Um, so yes, uh, female enslaver often is keeping a really tight watch over what food is, is or isn't in the larder, what's being produced out of the dairy, what's happening um, in the kitchen garden. Um, but enslaved people are finding ways uh, to kind of graft off uh, this food. Um, so the slave rebellion I study, all of the men, including Nat Turner, make sure to have a barbecue before. Um, and then they spend a lot of the rebellion um, dipping into the brandy stills. And they're, of course, the people doing the distilling. I mean, this is a whole other kind of taste making um, around heavy spirits. Um, but pigs going missing, you know, prized sides of, you know, smoked meats, all these things that take an incredible amount of skill to make them happen. Um, do you do you engage with enslaved resistance at all in the work? I do. There's a little bit in this Mary, I, I in this Mary Randolph chapter, um, where I try to one of the one of the unusual things that I turned up um, is I talk a little bit about Gabriel's Rebellion, which also had barbecues and also in many ways was uh, plotted and stay and sort of staged um, through Sunday suppers and things like this. Um, and interestingly in the, so this is a, a, a rebellion that was uh, very, uh, uh, very uh, deeply plotted, but then it ended up being foiled by uh, two things. One, there was like a terrible rainstorm. And so the the, the actual uh, unfolding of it had to be delayed because it was pouring so hard that people couldn't like get to their posts. And then in that moment, a couple of the people involved had second thoughts and confessed. And then this set in, uh, it set in motion uh, a situation in which all of the people were named and were arrested and were forced to confess and then they were killed. Um, but they, there is this, this testimony, and I say this not to you, Vanessa, because I'm sure you're familiar with this, but to everyone else. Um, and so there's this, um, there's a, a testimony from like 20 people involved in the rebellion, and several of them indicate that the goal of the rebellion was to, you know, some people say like it was to, you know, kill all the white residents of Virginia. Other people say it was to, you know, enact their own uh, functioning government. And then other people say, the, the end game was the Gabriel, the leader, envisioned a dinner in which he would bring white Virginians and black Virginians to the table and they would have a dinner together. Um, and they, somehow this would be like the symbolic, I mean, it's like a literal turning of the tables, right? It's like now who is serving whom kind of thing. And so in the end of that chapter, I tried to 
um, sort of spin that out a little bit in relationship to Mary Randolph, who was like peripherally involved in this. Because one of the interesting things is that, so the, the rebellion, like it sort of had these interesting fictional afterlives in large part because the white community was so terrified of this rebellion that had never happened, but seemed so well planned and like it would have worked. And so like they couldn't let it go. And so in all these of what was supposed to have happened if the rebellion had taken place. And in one of them, like 50 years later, there's one where it says, well, Gabriel was planning to take Mary Randolph as his queen and have her be the queen of this like post emancipatory state. And so I try to think about like, what does this mean to have this known slaveholder who wrote a cookbook where the whole cookbook is about control? Like it's exactly about what you were describing, like prohibiting the siphoning off of provisions and the, you know, the, um, the pilfering away of uh, dry goods and stuff that wouldn't be noticed. Like all of her recipes are deliberately like check-ins by the hour, they're super micromanaged, which essentially, because it, it gives an excuse to the, the, the slave, the woman's slave owner to like go into the kitchen a million times and check in on the people who are cooking and be like, well, the recipe says every half hour you need to measure in another teaspoon and it can only be a teaspoon kind of thing. This is the whole cookbook. And so it's like, what? so I try to think like, what does it mean that there's this woman who is essentially like the symbol of culinary control being taken as this like captive queen of this, the, the leader of the rebellion. Um, and again, I think it has to do with this awareness that like food and control and kitchens, like these were all sites of power and it was power that could turn at any instant, right? You know, because it was like, who was in control of the process, who really knew what was happening. Um, and because the food traveled literally to other people, like it did become this incredibly, um, you know, like uh, space of potentiality for, for both sides, right? Like, you know, both for control on the part of the slave holders, but also for enslaved people to not just imagine, but actually like enact resistance because they were proximate to um, this, these materials that would give them that power. So anyway, so that's, yeah, I guess that's, that's a little bit where I address it, but I think that this, all of this stuff, it, it's super interesting. Um, and, you know, as with like any book, there's so much more that, you know, it's like, could be said yeah, always, yeah. about yeah. certain things. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I hope those of you who haven't, uh, uh, had an opportunity to read the book now. Uh, now you've been convinced uh, that it's a, it's a great read and open opens up great doors and channels of conversations uh, between um, different disciplines and fields. Um, uh, and and this brings me to our last traditional uh, question uh, for Lauren, uh, which we ask most of our invited guests, which is, uh, and what's next uh, for Lauren Klein? What uh, I I know you were involved, like I because I know you from the world of digital humanities more. So it's like I'm, like I know the possibilities are are, are many here. So um, your book, Data Feminisms, is doing great. That's a lot of people discussing it and and referencing it. Um, what is the direction that, that, that your next project is taking? Um, you know, I mean, I think one of the things that this project has sort of borne out for me is that all of this work is connected, right? I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, all of these digital methods that we have and can use today really do have their roots in this sort of like late enlightenment view of quantifying things and uh, making things tractable so that it can sort of lead to future knowledge. And like this book is, you know, a teeny tiny part of essentially the, the project that like exposes the lie of that claim and as well as like the violence that sort of inheres in that fundamental belief that like things must be reduced and people can be reduced, right? To like, you know, data and numbers and things. And this is how we pursue, we collectively like very broadly conceived pursue greater knowledge. And so and actually I the the background for my my talk and actually part of the reason why I had the the Du Bois visualization in my presentation is because I actually am working on a project that's about the long history of data visualization. Um, and 
going back and showing both how, you know, there is essentially the same controlling impulse that underlies uh, the justification for slavery in these earliest data visualizations. You know, it's, it's, it's literally the same people, like the person who, Thomas Jefferson's favorite teacher at William and Mary was the personal tutor of the man who was very broadly believed to be like the first inventor of data visualization. So it was literally the same people who were um, uh, accelerating and um, endorsing the persistence of slavery and also creating these first data visualizations. And so I'm trying to sort of show, I'm trying to trace this history um, and to do it in a way that people who use and make visualizations, like it will register for them. Because I actually feel like I can say this to everyone here and you'll just nod and say like, yes, of course this is true. Um, but I don't think that this, the ways in which history and histories of race and colonialism and enslavement have been sort of convincingly translated into like the data world. Like I feel like there's more translation work that has to happen there. And so I'm trying to, I'm working on this project that it actually starts with, it puts the Playfair next to the Brooks slave ship diagram because those are actually created within a year of each other um, to be like, look, these are actually two versions of the same thing, right? And so if you're going to start the history of data visualization with essentially like a bar chart, which is what it is, like you also need to consider the diagram of the slave ship because the same impulse is present within both. And then I sort of try to, uh, I don't know, I actually haven't decided yet if it's like a parallel path or if it's a, a sort of intersecting path or if I wanna sort of say, well, I'm gonna do the counter history or what, but I do know that the end point is Du Bois. So uh, what goes in the middle, um, I'm still figuring that out. Thank you. And thank you everybody uh, for coming today to, to uh, Lauren's talk. I'm gonna pass the mic uh, to Ana Lucia Araujo who is going to tell us a little bit about our next uh, book club. Thank you, Lauren. Um, thank you so much everyone around. for being here and staying and listening and asking questions. I love how Ana's background is, you know, the library of books for the book club. I have to, I clearly have to up my background game with more, more books oh. behind. It, it, it's not easy because you have to, I have to arrange the, the table. Then folks, we have our next book club, which is going to be, if I am not mistaken, correct, if I am wrong with the date, this is March 24th. Um, and this is the book by Chelsea Stieber. And it's Hades, a Hades paper, war, post independence writing, civil war and the making of the Republic, 1804 to 1954. Then uh, join us on March uh, 24th. This is going to be at 5 p.m. Um, and uh, after that, I think we have on, uh, let me see, on April 14, we have another one uh, that is uh, this new book by Stuart Schwartz. And otherwise, if you want to know uh, about the, the schedule, just go to uh, slaveryarchive.wordpress.com and we have there uh, the, um, the schedule for the entire uh, year indeed until the end of uh, 2021. And once again, thank you so much, Lauren, for uh, the, um, this uh, presentation and for the book. If you didn't get the book yet, Go grab the book, uh, read, and come back also to, to watch the, the video again, because this is going to be on YouTube. Thank you, everybody. Bye.